Hello, Worship Arts. Um, happy week two. Uh, here we are getting to uh, be together again, um, regardless of where we are. Um, currently in my classroom at the moment, um, this might be one of the last uh, weeks or videos as far as recording from here. The next few might be in my at-home studio, aka just my living room, moving forward. But, um, but with that, um, regardless of where we are, um, doesn't um, stop our ability to be able to um, be together in spirit. Um, as we get to go through um, the Gospel of John together, um, as we get to reflect on being leaders of worship together, um, if uh, there isn't a time that's more in need of people to be good leaders as far as um, worship and community are concerned, um, then I don't know what it would be because this is a time that definitely needs that. Um, I hope you all are well. Uh, I miss getting to have you around and work with you, um, which I said last time, and it's still all the more true. So, um, so I want to use this video as a way to do a check-in of what we have this week, as well as talk through John chapter 2 with you. I'll make two other videos for this week, one for chapter 3, one for chapter 4, just so that we can kind of break those up and not have it be just one long portion altogether. Um, but for this week for Worship Arts, um, we have the Reflections again. Um, there are four total to do this time. Three that are songs, um, one that's a blog post. Um, as far as, and I, I haven't gotten to read, read every single one word for word at this point, but from what I got to see in the posts, um, I'm really excited to get to, to take more time with those. Um, you guys did a great job from the ones that I've seen. Uh, it was really encouraging this morning to open some of those up and start I'm going through some of you all sharing your hearts and um, the ways in which um, those songs are, are shaping you and <clears throat> helping you reflect on um, your own faith, your own walk with Jesus, um, especially at a time like this. Um, so I put another couple songs your way. Um, one was specifically requested by Grace, so, um, so feel free in your uh, responses if you ever are like hoping for um, a song in particular to be a part of one of these reflections that we're getting to do. I'd be happy to work some of them in, um, <clears throat> whether it'll be the next week or later on as we keep kind of moving forward. The article <clears throat> that I have you reading this week is a uh, blog post put forth by the Reverend Dr. Uh, Harrison, who's the president of the LCMS Church, which Valley's a part of. And I just put that your way because I'm interested in how you'll all read it and how you'll take it. <clears throat> um, the, I'm not going to interpret it for you because that's part of your job, but here's what I would say. When you read it, <clears throat> some of the parts that might stick out to you are some of the, the phrases he's going to use that seem like he's really trying to emphasize use of hymns in worship. And while he is, of course, addressing and talking about use of hymns in worship, it isn't a post that's just trying to say hymns are the only way to worship. It's just trying to focus on what hymns bring to the table in terms of worship that are powerful and helpful. Um, but take it when, when you reflect on it, I'm asking you to basically say, how do you read this and how does it impact or inform you as a worship leader? And if you say, I, I love it, I, I want to take on this mindset, great. If you say that I have, I have a couple things I would want to add to this, please do. So we have those um, assignments for you to do throughout the week, little by will, little. And we also this week then have John 2, 3, and 4 that we'll go to since we went through chapter 1 about a month ago, uh, but we're going to continue on together. I have notes posted in the digi digital resources um, section of uh, the bottom of the lesson that this is posted into, so please open up that file and write those notes into your class notes. Um, I know since you have the digital file, it might feel weird to just handwrite something that's typed, um, but I promise during this time, um, taking even notes and writing them by hand is going to be a helpful practice. Um, also is going to help make this hopefully feel a little bit like class in its own way. So feel free to write them in as we talk through things together. Um, pause videos as needed if you want to write stuff in based off of what we talk about when we talk about. Um, but with that, after we do our John 2, John 3, and 4 readings and discussions, there are discussion formal discussion posts for you to do on turnitin.com. Um, for each discussion post, I'm going to ask you to respond to the chapter and say, um, <clears throat> address how this chapter informs you or helps you grow as a leader of worship. Um, I'm going to ask that you respond to each uh, prompt 
but also within each prompt, reply to two other classmates. Now, since this is worship arts, it's not like an AP formal academic class. Um, your posts don't need to be the most formal ever as far as, especially your replies to each other. I just want your replies to be discussion furthering um, in which you are adding something or asking something or commenting to um, take that a post from someone else another additional direction. Um, it's the best way we're going to be able to have to kind of talk to each other during this time. So um, use that time or use the posts as ways to interact with each other and further discussion um, beyond just saying like, great post. So that's that. Moving forward then, John chapter 2. Um, I'm going to ask if you're um, able to do it, which you all are because you could just open it up on your phone. Um, open up to John chapter 2. We're going to read through a few of the portions, talk a little bit about notes together, um, and try to point out some things in like the theology formal sense of going through these chapters, and then head on over to turnitin.com and put a post up for your discussion. So with that, John chapter 2, um, the very first thing we open up to in John chapter 2 is the wedding at Cana. So I'm going to read through this and then we'll talk through a little bit. Feel free to follow along with me as we go through. So on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted, tasted the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory. His disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. This is a, a fun story. Um, one of the, the first things that I, I just want to start off with is, um, and you'll see this in the notes if you're following along with me, um, is that where Jesus starts his ministry, as John talks about it, is at a wedding. It's at a celebration. Um, Jesus uh, shows up to something that's, that's meant to be celebration, so meant to be fun, meant to be joyful. Um, and Jesus, uh, he, adds, he adds to the celebration. Um, he provides wine when they're looking for um, something to drink. So one, first and foremost, there's a level of Jesus that we don't always talk about. And it's, um, I had a professor in college that would always talk about it this way. He would say that Jesus has a lot more mirth than we give him credit for. Now, we don't always use mirth, but hear mirth as like <clears throat> playfulness, as um, having like a fun side, uh, having personality that you'd want to be around. Jesus starts his ministry by being fun. <laughs> There's a, a, a weird thing that we do sometimes where we, we make Jesus be only serious. Um, he's kind, of course, but, but serious in what he does. Um, know that um, Jesus, is, Jesus is fun. And I, I don't mean to try to sound um, weird or lame like, Jesus is fun, kids. <laughs> but but there's a, a fun and playful and mirth side to Jesus. He shows up to a celebration. He adds to it. The other thing that we saw at the end of that first or that section is it said that this is the first of his signs. John, uh, in his gospel, is going to include seven signs. Uh, and these seven signs are Jesus performing miracles, miraculous works, that are all meant to be seen as um, proof that he's God. Through seven signs, uh, Jesus is proving that he's God. Um, the first one here is Jesus turning the water into wine. Now this is um, significant, um, mainly, especially, well, two, two things. Each of these signs are Jesus doing things that God did all the way throughout the Old Testament. So they're meant to be things in which the people of the time would have said, huh, that's a miracle, but we've seen this before. God's done this. So that, as Jesus does these things, 
they can connect the dots and say, maybe he's God. Now, the, the water into wine isn't necessarily legitimately and literally an Old Testament thing, um, as much as it's this idea of God provides water all throughout the Old Testament, right? So Jesus provides something to drink. Um, the, the other thing that Jesus says here, which is a little bit of a foreshadow, when his mother goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, like, give them wine. Uh, Jesus says, what do you want me to do? My, my hour has not yet come. Um, we kind of know if you're connecting the dots whenever Jesus says the hour or my hour, it, he's talking about his time on the cross. So like when all of this, what all this is leading towards. So w a couple of things. One, it shows right at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus knows where this is headed. Two, it's interesting that it's a wine focused story because what is one of the things Jesus does right before he's arrested? He breaks bread and shares wine with his disciples in the Lord's Supper, the first communion, all happening at the Passover. So the wine, we know the wine later, Jesus is going to say, this is my blood. So, so at this first healing, at this first event, Jesus, through turning water into wine and focusing on the wine aspect there, is setting himself on this path towards what the Passover wine is going to be. It's the shedding of his blood. So we get a bit of a mix here. We have the celebration that Jesus is adding to, but we also have the reality of what it's all leading to, which is the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross as the Passover lamb. So it's a fun story, but it's a sign story and one that's going to point to the cross. The second story we have is, also, is we get fun Jesus and now we get... Um, uh, scary Jesus a little bit in this next portion. Jesus cleanses the temple. That's chapter 2, verse 13. It reads, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables. He told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Um, this one is a, a fascinating story. Uh, one, just because we get angry Jesus chasing people around with a whip. So we go from celebration Jesus to uh, righteous anger Jesus. Now, why is he so angry? Um, remember, the temple is where the people of God think God dwells. That's where they think God's presence is most present. So in their mind, if they want to be able to have community or relationship with God, they have to be able to go into the temple. What had happened here is the shift in the temple towards it being a business, it being a money-making industry, uh, selling animals specifically with like the temple endorsement as a way to be able to make money. What this was doing is it was keeping people out either people who were poor, didn't have money, um, people who weren't the ideal Jew of the time, who were being put out. And so what these money changers, these priests, what they're doing is they're drawing lines around God saying, you can't, you can't actually get to where God is. So they're, they're drawing a line. They're, they're making a, a, an exclusion of people. This is what makes Jesus so angry because what is Jesus here to do? He's here to bring people to God. He's here to be able to actually put his arms around anyone and everyone, which is the opposite of what these money changers and priests have been doing. So Jesus breaks down these systems. He, literally in this story, he breaks down all of their system of the money changing and the, the money making. But, but partly then what we see what Jesus is, is going to try to do, which he can still try to do through us today, Jesus wants to break down systems that are keeping people away from God. That, I say to you, as just a 
food for thought as a, as a think through. Um, what are maybe systems that we have today? What are what are things that we do, things that we set up that can actually be excluding, um, can actually draw lines around God and say, unless you are A, B, C, then you can't get to where God is. And we maybe don't use those words, but but maybe we give um, off that vibe, that feel. So where are we drawing lines and where might Jesus be wanting to break those things down? The last part of this story that's key is Jesus says, I can tear this temple down and raise it in three days. Now, the people there are thinking he means the building of the temple, which later is going to be something that they'll use against Jesus in his trial, saying he said he would destroy the temple. But it tells us Jesus is talking about his body. Remember that when we talk temple, again, like we said, we're talking about it as where the people think God lives, God dwells. So Jesus says here basically that he himself is the temple. He's the dwelling place, the presence of God, and that he's going to die. We have in chapter 2, we have the blood of the wine, we have the temple or the body. So we have in chapter 2, these first things that Jesus is doing are all pointing to Jesus' death and resurrection. So his ministry is all going to lead to. Jesus' body, the temple, is going to be destroyed, but in three days he'll raise it up again. They hear it as a threat. Jesus is telling it as hopeful news, good news. And that it's through that life found in the resurrected body of Jesus that all of these systems keeping people out can be broken down. Later on, Jesus is going to say to us, um, it's his disciples at the Great Commission and then us by extension, that he's leaving, but his spirit is with us and it's going to be with us always, the words, to the very end of the age. So Jesus says in this story that he's the temple. Later than after Jesus' death and resurrection, he's going to say that we are the temple, that God dwells with you and me, all of us, that we are the dwelling place of God. So making systems and lines that keep people out don't even make sense because you can't keep God out in a way from God's people. Jesus showed up to be able to bring us to God, uh, to let us know that God's arms are are around us always, that we are the dwelling place of God, all while reminding us that all of these things are possible and pointing to the cross and the empty tomb. That's our John 3 discussion. Get the notes down into your um, class notes, and then very shortly I'll be recording the John chapter 3 and John chapter 4 videos, Um, but feel free to space them out and do those in another day if you'd like to as we move forward. Um, God bless you guys. Uh, May the, the love, grace, peace, and joy of Christ be with you even in the midst of a time like this. Miss you all and see you shortly. God's peace.